Quantum information science just might have commercial impact before quantum computing achieves error correction. All sorts of vertical industries will be able to take advantage of quantum clocks and sensors, enabling better navigation and even seeing through miles of solid Earth. Find out about these amazing devices and what we expect from cold atom computers in this episode of the Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Karagiannis. I lead Quantum Computing Services at Prativity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guest today is the VP and Chief Quantum Advocate at Inflection. Uh, He's also the author of Dancing with Qubits and Dancing with Python. Dr. Bob Suter, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, uh, We've had folks on from uh, the companies that eventually merged into Inflection. (laughs) So uh, it's good to have you on uh, representing the the full brand. (laughs) Um, So tell us a little bit about the company and why its slogan is the world's quantum information company. Well, let me say, first of all, we're really good at slogans. Uh, (laughs) So uh, a previous one uh, was uh, making quantum matter which is... Uh, oh, that's funny, happen. yeah. <laughs> right, because yeah. On, on one hand, we, we do take atoms and we, we chill them mm-hmm. down to absolute zero, and that's quantum matter and it's fascinating things you can do with it. But it's also uh, a, a practical sense of, you know, let's make quantum practical. Let's make it actually useful for something. Uh, the company was founded in 2007. Uh, uh, Professor Dana Anderson at the University of Colorado at Boulder was, was one of the key founders. Uh, so, so that's the first thing, which is it, it's not a startup, <laughs> right? It, it's been a small company. It's, it was a small company, well less than 100 people for uh, most of its lifespan. Uh, but starting about uh, four years ago, they started to uh, think about using the cold or the neutral atom approach, not just for sensors and atomic clocks, but also for quantum computing. And hence enter uh, venture capitalists and, and family office investors and things like that. Because when you're working on hardware at that scale, um, it gets expensive very quickly as, as well as building up the staff. So um, it's a company that does, has done very well through the years, starting with this core technology of what happens if you take certain atoms. And here I'm talking about cesium, uh, rubidium, you know, those ones you may not have noticed in the middle of the periodic table, uh, but they have very special properties, uh, particularly when you hit them with lasers. In fact, our CEO, Scott Ferris, uh, is fond of saying uh, that uh, we shoot lasers at atoms. That's what we do for a living. And someone else asked me a question, well, how do you find the atom? How do you actually find it to shoot it? That, that, that's another thing. Um, this technology is, is surprisingly versatile. Um, before I was at Inflection, I was at IBM for many years in IBM Quantum. And they have a great approach with superconducting. It's, it's been a program uh, going on for decades, literally. But for me, I was just fascinated by all the different things you could do with this cold atom approach. And I consider this, uh, if you think of it as quantum computing, natural, or let's even say organic (laughs) quantum computing. We are taking things in nature that are normally quantum particles that normally exhibit quantum properties and using them to our, our advantage. So that is, we're not manufacturing things that kind of behave like nature. We're actually using nature. So this means trapping them, trapping the atoms in this case, Mm -hmm. using lasers, uh, steering them along using more lasers, putting them in the right position, using more lasers, um, executing operations on them in the case of computing. You know what we use for those now. Um, And um, exploiting these properties of superposition and entanglement and and interference. So, So it's an established company that is now looking across the spectrum, fundamentally now looking to productize quantum atomic clocks. So looking to move those um, through the years, uh, first for government and eventually for commercial uh, for commercial use. And then things like quantum radio frequency receivers. Who would have thought you can make an antenna out of very cold atoms? So lots of things to talk about. about yeah, that. yeah. We're going to 
click into all those for sure today. <laughs> um, maybe we could start with the um, antenna because that that's probably one I would bet no one's heard of. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, so let, let's let's first think about the the spectrum, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we toss around numbers like two point seven when we talk about cell phones, right? You know, certain frequencies on on which signals are transmitted. Well. You know, the range of frequencies is very large. Um, I, I grew up with FM radio, right? So 98.7, right? Things like that. That's mm -hmm. not just a number. It's a frequency. And um, when I think back about listening to an FM radio, perhaps if I was driving, well, okay, maybe I'm hearing the music. And as I drive further from that source, maybe I'm driving toward another city, lo and behold, there was another channel that had a frequency very close to it. And I started getting interference with it. I could hear both of them a little bit and then some static and things like this. So tra traditional antennas for radio frequencies, and this is the full gamut, uh, not just what we listen to, but light, and microwave, and, um, all, you know, the whole range of things here. Um, when the government gives out this spectrum, as I pointed out, 98.7, they may give you this, but they give you a little bit on each side to try to avoid this collision problem here. And also there's only a limited amount of this spectrum that is useful practically today. So what if we could make antennas that were much more sensitive? So in this case, my 98.7 really kind of nailed that one frequency. So if I wanted to use um, uh, 97, now I'm forgetting the numbers I use, um, so let's go with, with 97.7 because I completely forgot. If I want to use 97.72, right, a little bit closer here, um, uh, I could do that now with these quantum radio frequency receivers or antennas. And I can also push out the useful spectrum. So one thing to remember about quantum sensing um, is that it provides very high resolution. This goes back to historically, I think a lot of people know what MRIs are. If you've ever had a knee problem or a shoulder mm -hmm. problem, you've had an MRI. So they could look at what was going on. That is a quantum sensing application. It has been available since the 1970s. So this brand new quantum thing is maybe half a decade old, right? And things <laughs> like this. And, and people started using MRIs because they were safer. And they had higher resolution than x-rays. So in the same way, radio frequency antennas, the quantum flavors, have much higher resolution. They can use much less power and be much more versatile. Uh, the military likes this. I am told if you looked at the size side of a battle cruiser, you would see all these antennas uh, more actively in our day-to-day -day lives. You see cell phone towers. You look up at the top and there are these big boxes and horns and things like that. Many of those are RF receivers. We can replace those, we believe, in time with things that are about the size of a smartphone, a large smartphone, and perhaps four or five times thicker. And that's tunable. We can tune it to any frequency we want. Wow. So, yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of areas of sensing that aren't really getting love, right, <laughs> in terms of the industry. Because um, this is very commercial. It's very baked, as you said, you know, MRIs. Wow, since the 70s. Um, can you give our listeners like a simple little 101 on what quantum sensing really is, just so they can wrap their head around it on a bigger scale? Because for some of them, they only think of quantum computing. Yeah. So, sure. Let, let, let's think about, um, here's my, my, my recent favorite example, which is uh, a traditional gyroscope. And airlines today, commercial airliners use what are called ring gyroscopes with lasers. And it, it's, it's kind of an interesting idea. So I'm just going to imagine I'm holding up my hands here, if you're just listening, to try to make kind of a circle right, with my, with my fingers here. And what I'm going to be doing is imagining rotating this circle clockwise. Just a little bit. And, and that's to kind of simulate the idea of I'm rotating. The plane is rotating somehow, some way. How the heck would I measure that thing? All right. Well, the way we do it today, which, which I think is, is pretty cool, is we take a laser. And let's say we're doing it from the bottom. We split the beam 
So we have now two lasers, laser beams, and we shoot it around each side of the ring. And it comes out again near the bottom. Okay, well, again, fun with lasers, and we, we did it kind of in a circle here. And if nothing was rotating, those beams would emerge, basically being identical. They were identical to begin with. We just split one beam into two mm -hmm. pieces, but they were identical. However, if there was any rotation whatsoever in that, one of the beams would have traveled a slightly longer distance and the other beam a slightly shorter distance. So when they popped out at the bottom, these beams, the properties of them would be different. In particular, if we think of these as waves, so you can think if you're more math inclined, think of it as a sine wave, right? Up and down, snaking up mm -hmm. and down. Or if you think of dropping a pedal in a pond or something like that. And now you start imagining dropping two pedals and having the waves combine with each other. And this is interference. The same thing happens in the case of rotation with our laser beams. There's a little bit of interference. We can measure that. And that can tell us how much rotation. Okay. Not bad, you know, for traditional the uses of today. With quantum, we can be even more sensitive because we are replacing this ring with a ring of cold atoms. And we are taking advantage of this notion of superposition. People sometimes, to think about superposition in quantum computing, they might say zero and one at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Or Schrodinger's cat. Is it alive? Is it dead? Is it both? And things like this. Well, this gives us the two different things, whereas originally we had two different laser beams, we had two different states of quantum matter here. And once again, if there's any rotation, we can detect that interference at a much finer resolution than we could have even with the fancy laser setup. So it's these fundamental properties that people may have heard, but casually, like superposition uh, in quantum computing and interference which can be used for, well, as I just described, gyroscopes rotation. They can measure the change in your speed, what's called an accelerometer. They can measure gravity. Any sort of these changes, inertial changes to, to movement in any direction with very, very fine resolution. And that's why people are so excited about them. So, so the range of using these types of sensors in industry is huge. I mean, I could see it being used maybe in astronomy, for example, like radio telescope, you'd be able to get even greater resolution that way, right? Without having a giant device, possibly. That That's true. We could, we could do that, but let's even bring it closer to home. Let's put it in your car, mm -hmm. right? Because all of these things with a highly accurate clock, an atomic clock, because really... Remember, I, I, I mentioned speed, <laughs> distance divided by time, right? Rotation. How much have you turned in a unit of time? At the heart of all these things, which we call PNT, positioning, navigation, and timing, is a highly sensitive atomic clock. And if I know where I'm starting, and I have a very accurate clock that stays accurate for a long time, and I can detect my movement in three dimensions, if I know where I started, I know where I end up after a certain amount of time, which means I don't need GPS. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had on Boeing talking a little bit about what they're trying to do in this space. Um, so, so it's really interesting to hear your take on this. Well, for a long time, I, I, I was skeptical, skeptical of talking about GPS replacements because I was a little wary to say, oh, this is something that'll just never happen, right? You know, we're going to mm -hmm. scare people if GPS goes away. And then I started reading more. There was an article last month um, out of Israel that said that Tel Aviv had a six-month high of GPS spoofing and denial. And an airline pilot, commercial airline pilot, said that uh, he was going in for a landing at the Tel Aviv airport, and it said... He was actually in the mountains around Tel Aviv. Suddenly, all these sensors started going off. And, well, you know, lots, lots of interesting things happen over there. Um, evidently, there's a Russian base in Syria and there are drones. So they're trying to block GPS. Well, the Israelis on the other side, 
according to this article, also have their base and they are blocking. So all the way out to Cyprus, you've got this mess of what's happening with GPS. And so suddenly it's not just some sense, the bad guys, the other that's doing this to you. It's like, we're all doing this and it's messing us up. Right. And we'd love to stop. Um, I, I, I gave a, a, a talk in Colorado last month, and I found this example that GPS had been messed up within 50 miles of the Denver airport for several hours one day. So this is not FUD. This is something that's really happening, and this is something that's well within our capabilities of ultimately uh, building uh, and replacing GPS with these quantum sensors. Do you think replacing or working in tandem? Um for a while, it will be in tandem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, uh, with some of these things, uh, let's imagine a submarine, right? So submarine under the water, really not getting that much value from GPS. <laughs> um, they might have to surface every once in a while to get a reading of their specific location. Well, with these more sensitive and more stable types of sensors and the clocks, it means they can stay under the water much longer. Right. Mm -hmm. So you might still want some way of asserting uh, absolute position that might not be GPS. There are, in fact, some land based uh, ways of doing this. So, yeah, it, it's an augmentation or even if it's a double check. Am I really where that tells me I am? They'll probably exist in that way for a while. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of a fan of more sensors is better, <laughs> more types of uh, sensing, you know, like when Tesla got rid of everything except cameras, I just, I couldn't wrap my head around that. It, it just seemed like, why would you give up LIDAR? Why would you give up all these other ways of seeing the world, you know, and, and having better object detection? Yeah, so avoiding single yeah. points of failure, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. layering. Um, and so what other areas can sensing be used? Um, is there anything involved in climate research right now? Uh, with, with the way things uh, are? Well, in, in, in different ways. So um, rather than just think of climate, let's just think about um, what we call metrology, right? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is measuring things on the earth. Um, there are some experimental applications that can determine chemical compositions of certain things, uh, the air in certain spaces, and, and quantum sensors might be able to do that. Um, but let me get back to gravity for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a renewed appreciation for gravity. Um, and, um, when I was in the UK a couple of weeks ago, it was like, yeah, Isaac Newton would love this, the, the story. Um, <laughs> you know, I, th I think a lot of people tend to, to think about their walking around, uh, at quote, at sea level <laughs> and the gravity is perfectly constant. And maybe they know a few numbers like 32s or nines or things things like this, but gravity actually varies very significantly as we, as, as we move around. Um, let's say you were in an urban center and you were just walking down the street and there was, and you didn't happen to know this, but an underground parking garage. If you had a sensitive quantum gravimeter, you could tell by the change of gravity what that boundary was because the gravity would be a little bit less while you were over the parking garage and then it would increase. Now, also gravity going up and down, right? Of course, that's one thing. So measuring heights and, and different things like this. So it does have military uses. They're very interested in, in uh, hidden bunkers and that type of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but if a building collapses, is there a void where survivors may be, uh, may be trapped, may be saved? Uh, volcanoes. We use gravimeters today. They, they put gravimeters around uh, volcanoes so as the magma chambers start to fill up, right, with magma indicating an, an eruption is likely, the gravity increases. Well, if we can put more of those and cheaper of those in more places, we might be able to get more advanced notice of, of certain um, natural disasters, not just volcanoes, but they could be earthquakes, um, it could be tidal waves. It, it, it could be things like this. So, so rather than, than think about, um, you know, let's think about climate in, in the way of changes to the earth environment, you know, rather than climate. Think of it as changes to the earth environment as measured with quantum sensors to give us early notice in order to do something better. And we hope life saving with it. 
so in this case, more of these um, gravity meters, would they be able to um, increase the resolution? That's uh, right. In, they, in what you detect? That's right. So um, uh, on one hand, they would increase the re resolution. Um, right now, gravimeters are about the size of the thing that you would put in the back of a pickup truck. And here I want you to imagine maybe somebody's involved with mining in Australia or Brazil or someplace like this. So they want something portable. Eventually, we would want these to be much smaller. Uh, so uh, this does lead to something as, as we try to imagine, well, what will stop this possibly from happening? It's the photonics. So we talked about, you know, uh, inflection, cold quantity before us. Yeah, you know, we shot lasers at atoms. Photonics mm -hmm. are a key part of all of this. And thinking of quantum computing, it's not just cold or neutral atoms. It's things like ion traps. It's things like nitrogen vacancy. That is all the non-semiconductor approaches for quantum computing. Use lasers, use photonics. So what we need in the long run is to drive down the size and the cost of these to ultimately get photonic integrated circuits. And that will, we hope in about 10 years, assuming everything goes well in that parallel industry, right, be able to give us clocks that are perhaps size of a couple of coins stacked, smaller radio frequency antennas that we talked about, a little bit bigger than a cell phone, and also gravimeters as well. So we'll go from what looks kind of big now down to a rack size, down to something smaller. And if everything goes well and everything falls into place and we get the right government funding and impetus to support this, down to something much smaller that will fit in your hand. Now, when you're thinking of quantum sensing, typically I hear it in, in conjunction with networking. Like you want these sensors to be able to often communicate with each other, maybe while maintaining quantum information. So what's inflection seeing in quantum communication these days <laughs> so if we just start with quantum communications mm -hmm. a lot of the discussion immediately goes to secure communications so mm -hmm. people think about quantum key distribution right so securely sending something over a line and it's typically fiber optic so our friends lasers come back into play yet again right and things like this but if we think about a sensor right what is it doing? It's absorbing information from the environment. So as you mentioned, it could be radio waves, radio frequencies. It could be that for communication or, or, or anything else. We could be measuring gravity. We could be measuring speed. Um, and any of these types of things. The point is, is that quantum sensors give you a very nice way of taking data, some sort of data in the environment, and quantum encoding it. So we think of qubits in quantum computing in the same way. If you think of those atoms uh, in the sensors, we can think of those as qubits. This really fast and natural way of taking this information and encoding it in qubits with all the advantages we have. Like every time you add a qubit, you can double the amount of information. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, that, that's, that sounds interesting. And today, sensors... Uh, may convert to other forms. They may convert to digital forms, zeros and ones, maybe an analog form or something like this. But what if we wanted to keep that information in quantum form? What if we wanted to move that information so we could compute with it in a quantum computer, right? It turns out, as people think about quantum computing, they say, oh, I have this database of information. I'd like to put this in a quantum computer and think about all the things we can do with it. That is very expensive. In fact, it can be exponential to take regular old classical data and just stick it in a quantum computer. And oh, by the way, with today's quantum computers, you're going to run out of time. You're going to load your data and have no more time left in the qubits to do anything useful whatsoever. So you get it almost for free from sensors. So we need to network the sensors to quantum computers and eventually sensors to quantum storage facilities, quantum memory, right, and things like this. So now this has opened up a whole new type of, of networking beyond what we've thought about before. What does it mean to transport two entangled qubits or two entangled quantum particles across a network? 
how does that exactly work? Because they're operating as a single object, if you will. How do you do that? Um, how do you actually take whatever's going on inside the sensor and put it in an optical form for photons and then ship it across? What happens if it starts picking up noise, right? Mm -hmm. Because I can't send this a long distance. I can't send it a thousand miles. I have to have repeaters, but I need quantum repeaters, not classical repeaters. Yeah, they've so, been a sticking point, <laughs> quantum repeaters. The no cloning it, principle, it, it becomes a problem. <laughs> that's right. I mean, I, I when I first heard about the no cloning principle, which says very simply, if you have quantum data, you cannot make a copy of it. I remember, in fact, I was sitting right here. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> you've got to be kidding. <laughs> right? where, where do we go from here? Right. But yeah, it, it opens up all this. And so it's like you you know, you're imagining these classical approaches to problems like networking. And then you've got to turn your head 90 degrees and think about it in a whole nother way. So maybe repeaters are, for example, small quantum computers because they have to do operations. How yeah. small? Right? Well, if they're small quantum computers and all this big focus has been on quantum computers in the data centers quantum supercomputers, right? What about quantum computers at the edge? That's where a repeater would live, right? Or or in a data center, but in the networking part of the infrastructure, it's not taking up all this room on the floor, things like this. So a lot of what we do uh, with inflection, um, <laughs> thinking about taglines and, and, and slogans and things like this is we believe in looking at the edge, the application. Sensors live at the edge. What does computing, what will computing mean at the edge? What must be the capabilities of them? How big is big enough for quantum computing for these types of applications? Because we've learned from computing over and over and over. Yes, we start with great big computers, right? Mainframes, remember those? 64 and on. Now we have phones. <laughs> My phone would have been a supercomputer 30 years ago. So we know how this is going to play out. We've seen this movie multiple times, right? So rather than just worry so much on yet one more flavor of a quantum computer in the data center, let's look beyond that. Let's bring some of these other technologies to market sooner, like sensors, like atomic clocks, like RF receivers. And that's why we think really good chance we'll see commercial value from these or and even more commercial value before we see it coming for quantum computers. So what roadmap do you have then right now? Um, it's been a while since we've talked to uh, the cold Kiwana side of it. Uh, mm -hmm. What roadmap do you have now? We had Hilbert, right? That was 100 uh, qubits. Is there anything you could share about the next uh, generations coming? Sure. So, um, so, Hilbert, we consider an R&D project at this point. So Hilbert is the name of our quantum computing effort. Mm -hmm. um, we put it on the cloud uh, for a few weeks last year, and then we took it down. And I will say, we probably could have been a little bit more uh, uh, explicit about being a prototype. Because when we looked at it, uh, and particularly we looked at the photonics, we realized we could do better. That is... Ultimately, we needed to run circuits faster. We need to, to run the, uh, them with greater fidelity. That is, fewer errors. So mm -hmm. um, in some sense, you can imagine taking the machine, taking it apart, all the pieces are on the ground, replacing certain parts of it, and then bringing it back up to increase uh, what's called the repetition rate, but also the fidelity, and especially with the, the two-qubit operations that we do. For those of you who know quantum computers, um, a lot of times uh, people talk about C naughts or CX, two qubit operations. Um, ours uses CZ operations, control the Z gates and, and things like this. So we have decided that um, we are still working on this 100 qubit generation, but we're working on the control aspects of this. We believe that likely we'll go through two or three generations with this. So current generation, as I said, roughly will peak around a hundred. Second generation will be about a thousand. Now we know that we we can do some of this because we've already built, if you will, a proto qubit array where we have had 35 by 35 atoms 
like arranging a checkerboard. And that's what they look like in, in these applications. We've successfully been able to lay that out. And by the way, that, that checkerboard, that array of over a thousand atoms is just about the width of a human hair. And it's in a glass cell. And once again, it's programmed using lasers. Now, we will then have some decisions to make about what we want to do. The, the reasonable, <laughs> get, given um, the progression here, the reasonable thing is to look at, well, can we put 10,000 cubits mm -hmm. uh, on this? And, and that would be great. And I can see our doing that. Um, a lot of these numbers are significant because um, l let me call um, such an array um, a quantum core. All right, so if we look at IBM and they have a chip with 100 something or 400 qubits on a chip, that's a quantum core. So it's a fixed unit. It's currently the entire quantum processing unit, but it's a fixed thing with a fixed number of qubits in it. Ion traps, right now they have a few dozen. Uh, we think we can go to 1,000. If we're lucky, things work out and we want to do it, maybe 10,000. This becomes very important for error correction. Because right now, uh, despite what some people say, the best estimates are we'll need somewhere between maybe 700 and 1,300 physical qubits for one error corrected uh, qubit, one logical qubit. Well, you'd love to fit all those in one core, right? You'd like mm -hmm. to have all those operations happening in one core. So if you have significantly less than 1,000, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have to start networking the cores together. And how easy is that to do? And what methods might you apply? So it's for this reason, so that we could look at, at as I've described it, um, improving the fidelities, how we will scale, looking more practically at what the uses of quantum computers will be at the edge versus just in a data center, right? And then also start to think about these notions of, of networking the cores together, right, to, to build bigger quantum computers. That's why we kind of pulled it back into R&D. Okay. Um, now, in terms of the other products, um, atomic clocks, atomic clocks, atomic clocks, those will show up everywhere. We mentioned a few applications. Timing is critical just for traditional networks, high-speed networks. Um, there are, in some sense, pauses in networks. Uh, things are sent around in packets. Transactions have to be timed. If I'm doing high-speed trading back and forth, right? Timing is critical. Um, when I was growing up, um, you know, where did energy come from when you plug something into? Well, it came from that nuclear power plant or that coal power plant, or maybe if you're near Canada, hydro plant or something like this. But it came from these great big colossal energy generating plants and, and flowed through the network to me. Well, okay, now we have windmills and now we have solar panels. Some are commercial, some are on people's roofs. Uh, we have geothermal. So we have things coming from many different sources entering the network, right? And then going back out and sharing. And so this network is very much more complicated and also bi-directional in cases like this. How do you optimize this? The timing is critical for the control of this. So once again, atomic clocks and many of them uh, throughout. So this is why we believe that atomic clocks will over time become really pervasive uh, across what we do. Yeah. Uh, when you think of atomic clocks, you think of the big cesium one that, you know, is used for, for its accuracy. And you mentioned cesium earlier. So it makes That's me right. wonder, are we going right back to cesium again? <laughs> um, depending, cesium and rubidium are, are, are very good choices. And um uh, uh, in general, people throw out a few more types of atoms, like uh, for these general quantum applications, like strontium and so forth. Uh, they all live in the same neighborhood of the periodic table. Some of them are a little bit better than others based on um, the types of lasers you use, uh, things like how much does it cost to get a laser at that frequency and, and things like that. But yeah, down deep, they're going to be these little uh, glass cells filled with mm -hmm. some cesium or rubidium atoms with little photonic circuits optically driving what they do. That's what life will be like in, in 10, 15 years. So we're going to be replacing the big atomic clock with these tiny little ones soon, uh, most likely. Well, yeah, not, not 2024, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, initially uh, as good as that. Um, at, and let, let me actually do a plug. I'm sitting here in New York and um, 
Me too. <laughs> okay, I, I'm in upstate. Um, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, in moving to first Cold Quanta, which then renamed itself Infection, I, I got to go to Colorado, where the company was founded. In particular, Boulder, Colorado. I had no idea of all the quantum things going on in Boulder, Colorado. So the cesium clock uh, you mentioned is, in fact, the most sensitive, stable atomic clock in the world is mm -hmm. in Boulder, Colorado. Um, the, the, the number of, of, of research physicists, it's like right there in the middle of the country. Um, there is such a wealth of uh physics scientists and engineers um, that are based in Colorado doing a lot of this work. So, um, but Colorado is always great to visit. It's, 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 it's not too shabby. It's rather pretty, those Rockies, right? Uh, but to just be in this community with all these people doing the types of quantum things that frankly, I had no experience with uh, has been a real joy right? and, and intellectually really uh, interesting. Yeah. It's almost like a mini quantum Silicon Valley that people haven't really uh, paid enough attention to <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. Is it like the quantum range or something like that or the quantum yeah. Rockies or, or things like that? Yeah. Um, I call, I call the corresponding New York version, by the way, the quantum throughway. This is <laughs> quantum yeah. Through, yeah. because upstate New York is yet one more place. Uh, photonics, Rochester, New York, uh, is one of the three major photonic centers in the United States. Uh, you've got the air force research laboratory, um, east of here in rome um so the quantum world is growing up outside silicon valley in some very surprising places mm -hmm. and uh, i think it's an interesting side story when people look at this and ask why and what is the history and how it's all coming together so if you had to i guess in closing make a prediction what would be the first killer application then for something like an edge device, be it a sensor or, or something like that? What do you think is going to just take off overnight once it really hits? I, I think it's going to be these uh, initially these rack size atomic clocks and then moving a little bit smaller. Um, and and we, we include that in the general sensor category, things to mm -hmm. do with, with, with cold atoms in different ways. Um, along with that, um, we, we've gotten a lot of interest in the RF, receivers, the antennas. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, um, I'm thinking a good bet is uh, with gravity. Um, <laughs> you know, again, strange as it may seem, um, I think a lot of what happened with quantum computing, uh, I was involved with a lot of the early, uh, uh, you know, making it public and educating people when I was with IBM, along with many other people and things like this. But it was one of these things was like, oh, quantum, that's so cool. Tell me about it. Computing. I know what computing is and things like this. Gravity is another one of these things that people, in a real sense, fundamentally get. And I think the applications are going to be very rich. They're going to be very tangible in many ways in our life. Um, and the gravity sensors will help explain the value of the other ones. So um, commercially, as I described it, atomic atomic clocks plus quantum RF receivers, gravity as the big explainer topic that brings sensors home to people for the value and just to know how they work. And, and just think, if there's some disaster movie in the future, you could totally imagine these gravity sensors being involved, right? You know, <laughs> like we're figuring That's out right, something yeah. major. The is all shaking and we're getting <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. You get a logo then uh, in, in a box in a movie like that. Inflection um, inside, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this. I, I thought this was great. Um, we don't talk about sensors enough. And, and I think you did an amazing job of, of really making it clear what they are. It was so, fun. It, it, yeah. It's a it's a fun topic. You know, all these all these quantum things. The more you learn about it, um, you know, as I mentioned, gyroscopes. I knew nothing about gyroscopes. <laughs> I was really <laughs> this is really cool. <laughs> right? So um, yeah, yeah it's it's just quantum is something you learn something new every day, and it's just uh, for so many reasons. I, I just think, and I've said this before in terms of computing. I just think it's going to be the killer tech for for this century. Uh, yeah, and, and I should mention, we'll be partnering with Inflection as part of Chicago Tech Week on July 13th. Right. Uh, uh, Peter Knoll, who was on the show before, uh, he'll be uh, doing a fraud detection demo with us. So it'll be good Excellent. to see some Inflection folks again soon in person. And, that's right. Uh, yeah. More, yeah. more from a software angle. We, did, we didn't talk about software, but yeah, our <laughs> yeah. tech friends like Peter, 
Uh, <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So yeah, thank you for coming on. All right. Very good. Take care. Now it's time for Coherence, the quantum executive summary, where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. Since 2007, Inflection has been focused on using cold or neutral atoms for sensors, atomic clocks, and quantum computers. They basically shoot lasers at atoms, to quote their CEO, but it's not that simple. Lasers trap, steer, position, and execute operations on atoms. That leads to an array of usable technologies. Inflection is applying the technology to antennas that are more sensitive. On that note of increased accuracy, we get to other types of quantum sensors. Laser-controlled gyroscopes can use the technology for more accurate positioning. Highly sensitive atomic clocks enable this, allowing for non-GPS navigation that keeps track of movement. Gravimeters are an even more futuristic sounding application of quantum sensing. Imagine detecting changes in gravity caused by something buried deep in the Earth, for instance. The cold or neutral atom approach does not require large refrigerators and is expected to be used in the next generation version of Hilbert, the company's quantum computer. They're targeting 1,000 qubits in 2024, all at room temperature. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Bob Souter for joining to discuss Inflections Technologies. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Pertivity's The Post Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on all socials at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Pertivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Pertivity.com or follow Pertivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. Thank you.